It is the pre-dawn hours in the Bay of Maine as a lone humpback breaks the surface. The whale is a subadult female, around 30 feet in length. Her movements are slow and laborious, and as she spouts, she senses the predator closing. For hours, the shark has doggedly pursued her, biding its time. It is a terrifying apparition, the likes of which haven't prowled these waters for millions of years. The exhausted whale bears down, desperately striving to put some distance between herself and her pursuer. Her efforts are in vain. Hi, this is Max, and I've got a great show for you today. We're going to be looking at ginormous bites taken out of a humpback whale that appears to have been killed by a monster shark. And we're going to be estimating the size of the attacker. Was it a megalodon? We're about to find out. Before we get started, don't forget to like and comment. And if you're not already a subscriber, please do so. Our story starts off on July 4th of this year, when a dead humpback whale was spotted about five miles off Briar Island, Nova Scotia. The first person to photograph the whale's remains was Amy Tudor, a marine naturalist and wildlife photographer. Amy was working for Mariner Cruises, a whale watching company, when she spotted the carcass. They were on a tour, one that caused them to drift within 15 to 20 feet of the remains, but they were unable to stay long. Amy was shocked by the huge bites that had been taken out of the whale and managed to take some spectacular photos with her 600 millimeter lens. Before we examine images of the dead whale in detail, let's discuss where the attack originated. Based on the freshness of the carcass, the act of predation most likely occurred in the Gulf of Maine, which empties into the 600 foot deep waters of the Bay of Fundy. The region is known for the whales that frequent it, which arrive both famished and in large numbers during this time of year. Although the carcass was surprisingly fresh when first seen, as it continued to drift with the tide, it soon began to rot. According to the locals, it initially made landfall on the south side of an island called Long Island, which is about one kilometer northeast of Briar Island. This happened between the 7th and 9th, after which it was pulled back out to sea by the region's impressive tides, where it continued to decay. Its location would eventually be pinpointed by Amy Tudor's husband, Jess, a former first responder, fire department captain, and manager of Welcome Aboard Whale Watch. Although Jess had gotten word that the dead humpback had been spotted on July 15th off Long Island's north side, due to conflicting reports, he initially ended up scouring the south side from the 16th to the 19th. After studying wind and wave action, he finally switched to the north side on July 19th, where he soon pinpointed the carcass. It was beached just south of Tybert's Landing, near a community called Central Grove, around five kilometers from Briar Island. Jess confessed that over the previous three days, he'd walked over 20 kilometers while trying to locate the whale's remains. When discovered, the carcass was belly down, although this changed with the tide. Per Jess, and based on the condition of its skin, the whale had been dead around two to three weeks. It was a subadult humpback and, including the missing portions of its head, was around 30 feet in length. After hearing about the bite marks, I was excited to see the initial images and video. The moment I saw them, I realized there were unusual things going on. As Jess pointed out, there was a surprising number of bites on the whale's underside. Usually, shark bites tend to be on the dorsal. That's because when a whale dies, it typically takes a while for sharks to zero the carcass. Abdominal bloating from a buildup of gases often results in it flipping over, so the dorsal is submerged and the ventral, or belly side, is above the waves. With the belly region out of reach, sharks tend to feed on the dorsal. To me, this strongly suggests that the whale was right side up and still fresh when the sharks began feeding. Another thing I noticed was what appeared to be a gigantic bite on the caudal region in front of the flukes. I also observed what looked like visible tooth marks around the edges of this prospective bite. Sadly, 
Due to the whale's less buoyant tail remaining submerged, the caudal bite is not visible in the photos Amy took when she first saw it at sea. However, with Jess having been on multiple expeditions studying great white sharks, he was more than happy to return to the carcass to investigate said bite for me, including measuring it and checking for individual tooth punctures around its periphery. As most people know, sharks have multiple rows of teeth, and the outermost row often leaves tooth punctures or rakes around wound edges. When he first viewed the caudal bite, Jess also noted a strange rectangular excision mark. In fact, there were two of them. As you can see, these cuts were not made by a prop. They were done by hand and deliberately, and strongly suggest that some individual or individuals remove samples from the wound. One is in the center of the bite, and the other overlaps the upper left edge. The question is, why were these samples taken? If I had to guess, I would say the outer edge may have been removed to preserve tooth impressions that, combined with bite width, could be used to calculate the size of the attacking shark. The center portion is more unusual, perhaps an attempt to gather DNA from the attacker. Four feet. Four feet. Hmm. How's that for a bite? On July 23rd, Jess returned to the carcass and this time took measurements of the bite. As you can see from the video, he came out with a bite width of 4 feet 4 inches or 52 inches. A bite that size would be similar to, or even larger than, the astonishing bite scar photographed on a 40-foot whale shark back in 2017 by marine biologist Dr. Simon J. Pierce. The whale shark's attacker, which I christened the Galapagos Giant, may hold the record for the largest extant shark bite ever recorded, and could potentially indicate a macropredatory shark as big as the whale shark it attacked. At this point, Jess began disassembling the carcass and collecting the now thoroughly rotten whale's bones. This is the ninth whale Jess has found thus far washed up on the beach, and his skill at dissecting dead whales and preserving their skeletal remains over the years has earned him the name the Whale Bone Collector. He started collecting the bones from this humpback on the 19th. By August 6th, however, the carcass had become so putrid and gelatinous that he had to tie it off so that it wouldn't be dragged away by the region's 25-foot tides. In the end, he managed to acquire the entire skeleton, complete with a shattered scapula which, combined with other evidence, tells an interesting tale. That said, let's get down to the good stuff and focus on the questions that ultimately matter. The first is, how was the whale killed? Was it a shark? The answer is yes and no. The shark that was involved in this attack appears to have been huge, but as most people know, the bigger a shark gets, the slower it becomes. It's part and parcel to having your muscles affixed to a skeleton made of soft cartilage. We know from a 2018 study by Queen's University in Belfast that a breaching basking shark can generate as much thrust as a similar sized white shark. Makes sense, as they're both mackerel sharks and share a similar body plan. Thus, a 26-foot white shark would probably top out at around 12 miles per hour. A larger shark would be even slower. A frightened humpback, however, can do around 17 miles an hour. Hence, under normal circumstances, a healthy whale this size would normally be very hard to catch. So how did it happen? Luckily for us, one particular photo Amy took has turned out to be a veritable treasure trove of information. Right now, we're going to focus on this section right here. What we're looking at is a large patch of raw and exposed flesh at the base of the neck and shoulder region near the pectoral fin. If you look closely, you can see it's not a shark bite. There are a series of grooves cut into the still fresh meat that look like a giant weed whacker tore into it. This is a prop wound, and it confirms what Amy and Jess theorized that the humpback was the victim of a ship strike. 
It wasn't rammed by a big vessel, however, which would have shattered many of its ribs, if not its back. In fact, of all the bones, only one shows a noticeable break, the right shoulder blade. Keeping in mind that this is a sub-adult humpback, the vessel that did this damage was not overly large. Cruise lines, cargo ships, and big military vessels can have props over 20 feet in height, and even one half that size would have cut the whale's head clean off. A lobster boat is also contraindicated as they have special cages that shield their props. This appears to have been done by a small ship or a large boat of some kind. To put things in perspective, a 55-foot vessel has props that, depending on pitch, could range from 30 inches to a yard or so across. It's very likely a propeller that size inflict this wound and fractured the hapless whale's right shoulder blade as it tore through its flesh. We know this because the damaged scapula shows evidence of repeated impacts, yet shows no sign whatsoever of bone healing. If I were to take an educated guess as to what happened, I believe the humpback was struck by a small ship or large boat's prop while traveling through the Bay of Maine. It might have been asleep. The resultant wound was large and bled profusely, but it wasn't fatal, at least not immediately. The blood began to attract sharks, however, and soon enough something very big and nasty took advantage of the humpback's half-crippled state and moved in for the kill. As is the norm, the attacking shark targeted the whale's caudal region. This was done to avoid a retaliatory strike, cripple the whale by destroying its means of propulsion, and finally cause it to finish bleeding out. This probably happened quickly, and once the big one had its fill, a horde of smaller sharks of assorted sizes moved in for the grizzly feast. Our next question is, what species of shark was it? I'm sure the question on everyone's mind is, was it a megalodon? The short answer is no. If there was a breeding population of the extinct 50-foot hunter scavenger, we would know. The odds are that, as researchers have previously suggested, white sharks occasionally fall victim to excessive growth, i.e. gigantism. I address this in Monsters and Marine Mysteries along with a few known examples. That would make sense, as such a mutation would be incredibly rare. Its extreme size would make mating and passing on said genes unlikely, and it would also explain why we don't see more of them, as a breeding population of at least 500 animals isn't necessary. Next up, we need to try and gauge how big the attacker was. Is it possible to do so based on the evidence we've collected? Two of the best ways of determining shark size are bite width and tooth crown size. With a bite measured at over four feet, I couldn't help but wonder if it was the work of the Galapagos giant. However, as I poured over the video footage and stills, I noticed that the wound Jess measured seemed a bit off. It looked different than the caudal bite I'd seen in the initial footage. It didn't have that semicircular shape, and there were several sandbar-like ridges of tissue present along the bite edges that weren't visible before. I realized that, before Jess had returned to the carcass to measure the caudal bite, the body had shifted with the tide. The caudal bite was somewhat hidden at this point. You can see it peeking out here, and he'd ended up measuring a more visible wound that was further from the flukes. It's tricky, dealing with a carcass this messy. Things start to shift, and the flesh becomes more amorphous over time. I had to get creative in order to figure out which wound was which. I accomplished this finally by using one of Amy Tudor's earlier photos as a reference point. As you can see, this whale was a female. You can clearly see her vaginal slit. It is topped by a bunch of large barnacles. I'm sure that couldn't have been pleasant. And is flanked by her mammary slits. At the base of the genital slit, you can see this knobby bit called the hemispherical lobe. And last but not least, the anus. For those of you that have never seen a whale's butthole before, I'm sure this is a rare treat. Moving right along. Now that we have a reliable reference point, we can use that to determine which wound Jess ended up measuring. First, let's look at this still of the carcass from a day or two earlier. 
On the far right, we see that gigantic bite with its telltale shape. The two rectangular sections of excised tissue are visible as well. To the left of that, we see the vaginal slit and above it, those telltale barnacles. Let's do a side by side, just to confirm things. In the more decomposed beast remains, the vaginal slit is still present, but it is now puckered up because it's been compressed. The whale's tissue has become somewhat gelatinous at this point, like a wet sock starting to sag toward one's ankles. Hence, the slit has been compressed as well. Now that does create an intriguing possibility. The fact that our bite may have been compressed too. It does seem a bit high, meaning bites like that tend to be more semicircular. Originally, it may have been a bit wider. However, in the interest of being conservative, we're going to work with what we have. Now, using the vaginal slit and barnacles as our starting point, and going side by side again, we can now determine that this deep bite here corresponds to this wound here, and the other two under it are here and here. Again, you see some compression on the beached remains versus the fresh carcass, which means then that the huge wound that Jess measured was, in fact, this one right here. We can confirm this via this video footage, wherein, after Jess measures the big wound, the camera pans right. We see the deep wound next to it, which corresponds to this one in the still, and to the right of it are telltale barnacles. Note, this footage is later, and when compared to the footage from days earlier, we can see that many of the barnacles have slowed off along with the skin they rested on, or have just become covered with gunk. Again, we see that puckered up vaginal slit. Directly to the right of the genital slit is our caudal bite. So, was the 52-inch wound that Jess measured also a single humongous bite? We're able to answer that question courtesy of some of Amy's other photos, which, by the way, we're incredibly lucky to have. It is very rare that we get such great pics of a fresh carcass. By working our way along the body using these stills, we can see that the large wound with those telltale notches of flesh is in fact this section right here. It represents a group of five or so bites, probably inflicted by the same ravenous shark. The culprit was most likely a white shark or tiger, and it was not small, possibly 20 or more feet in length. But this is not the work of our mega shark. Which leads us back to our massive caudal bite, which, as you can see, is quite sizable when compared to the group of five bites to the far left. So, how do we estimate the size of this bite as well as the shark that inflicted it? For that, we need to figure out a way to approximate bite width, which is tough. Luckily, we have a reference point for that as well. In this clip, Jess wisely pressed his boot up against one of the smaller bites for comparison. Said boot was officially measured at 13 inches. By catching the exact frame where he touches down, I was able to calculate the distance from his heel to the top of the excised area is around 1.54 times the boot's length and measures approximately 20 inches. Comparing that to the caudal bite, we see that the bite is, at a minimum, 1.7 times as wide. I say that because, as the still shows, the far right side of the excised region of the bite is cut off by the shot. If we go by the visible portion, that gives us a bite width of around 34 inches. If I cut back and use this shot instead, the same 20 inch boot bite compared to the full bite gives us a ratio of 1 to 1.8, resulting in a bite width of around 36 inches. We're looking at a hellaciously huge mouth. Last but not least, there is more than one bite this size on the carcass. This gaping belly wound may or may not be one, but this fleshy crater beside the prop wound definitely is. If we zoom in, we can see the individual tooth notches, their characteristic gouges the calling card of a gigantic shark. Precise measuring is, of course, impossible, but knowing that this was a humpback pushing 30 feet in length, and that their pectoral fins typically range from 25 to 30% of their length, 
that means that this female's flippers were anywhere from 7 to 9 feet long. Based on photographic studies, I've calculated an approximate 1 to 3.5 ratio of flipper width to length, which means that the flipper shown here is around 2 to 2.5 two feet across. Taking force perspective and camera angle into account, this wound is likely a yard or more across. Most likely, as our mega shark closed to feed, it was attracted to the open wound. As shown on this diagram, that secondary bite would have ended up about here, right next to or even partially on top of the prop wound that fractured the whale's right scapula. So, how big would the shark be that left these wounds? Obviously, any number crunching is going to be an approximation, as we're basing bite width estimates on a comparison of multiple screen images. Still, we have an accurate measuring stick in the form of Jess's boot, so we should be in the ballpark. Using Klua and Reed's formula from their 2017 paper, contribution of forensic analysis to shark profiling following fatal attacks on humans, which, by the way, is the most conservative one I've seen, can help us calculate white shark length based on bite width. Working from a 34-inch incomplete bite, we get a fish 30.8 feet in length. If we use the full bite width of 36 inches, we're dealing with a 32.5 foot animal. Weight? At 32 feet, and based on a 20 foot female great white weighing 4,200 to 5,000 pounds, somewhere around 8.5 to 10 tons. So, roughly the size of the whale it finished off. Considering the combination of cavernous bite marks and huge tooth punctures, this overwhelmingly suggests the existence of yet another giant macro-predatory shark. For those that have read Monsters and Marine Mysteries, you may recall that evidence of the estimated 26-foot white shark known as the Beast of Briar Island came from this exact same region. This new shark appears to exceed the beast in size, as well as the 26-30-foot Perth Cannon Colossus, and is exceeded thus far only by the potentially gigantic Galapagos giant. Although it's hard to picture a flesh-eating shark as big or bigger than a stretch limo prowling today's oceans, more and more evidence is popping up which suggests that we do indeed have giant sharks out there. They are incredibly rare, maybe just one in 10,000, but when they make their presence known, they really do. Incredibly, and courtesy of Jess Tudor's backbreaking efforts, the skeleton of this unfortunate humpback whale is now on permanent display back at his business, the Briar Island Sea Salt Company. If you're ever on Briar Island and want to see or even touch evidence of a real-life mega shark, be sure to check them out at 491 Water Street, Westport, Nova Scotia. There's no charge to view the skeleton, just make sure you tell them that Mac sent you. Also, if you're interested in compelling evidence of not only monster sharks, but octopi and squid big enough to eat whales, Gary LaMotta's Mega Turtle, and more, be sure to pick up a copy of my Amazon number one bestseller, Monsters and Marine Mysteries. Last but not least, if you haven't already, please take a moment to pop onto my official website at maxhawthorne.com and sign up for the monthly newsletter. While you're there, check out the Cronus Rising Paleo Gallery, which features incredible marine predator paintings by top artists, as well as a free books page. I hope you enjoyed my investigation into this latest mega shark, and I look forward to your comments.